So what I'm going to do is I wrote this book. Can you hear me on here? Is this? Uh, this is called Drinking from the Trough, a Veterinarian's Memoir. You know, over the last few months, I've been thinking, drinking from the trough, a veterinarian's nightmare. <laughs> but it was good, and we sent it in by email to She Writes Press, and the next day they emailed back the contract. So it was, that was cool. Yeah. And I thought, who me? <laughs> so anyway, um, we'll talk about Ivy later, um, and this is really loose. So I would like to read part of one chapter, the first chapter of the book, and then we can do some questions and answers. And then I brought some things about therapy dogs, like the member book and the Alliance of Therapy Dogs. And there's one page missing because Ivy was in this issue. Oh. And <laughs> so let's say if Diane was a certified dog therapy woman, and Ivy's my dog, she couldn't take Ivy. She would have to take her own therapy dog. So I can only work with Ivy. So, and it's fun, because I go, we go to a, 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 a nursing home once a week. I have no name. I go in, and it's, Ivy's here! And there's one gentleman who, who has a stoma and he can't talk. And I said, do you want to pet the, do you want to pet the, I mean, it's just all like that. And they just love her there. So I think I will win the glasses. Okay, so this is chapter one, part of chapter one. After the, introduction, the prologue, and everything, so I thought this was a good chapter to start with, okay? So thank you again for coming, and the first chapter is called Cupcake, all right? My first night call was for a house call to a bitch that had just delivered puppies. By the time I got there, the pups were dead. I talked to my client, who turned out to be a friend of my husband, Earl, and then I left. I didn't charge him anything for the house call because I really didn't do anything. Rachel, my boss, was furious when she found out I hadn't charged him. So furious, I thought she was going to punch me out. Who would want to punch out somebody who's taking steps? <laughs> she ranted at me, all calls get at least a night charge. Well, how was I supposed to know that? This was definitely not the kind of teachable moment I expected from a mentor. Maybe taking this job hadn't been such a good idea. Low pay and no doctor present weren't helping me learn what was not taught in vet school. I began wondering if vet school had help itself had not been a had been a bad idea, as if it had been a bad idea to leave my tenured teacher <coughs> job four years earlier. <coughs> But I was here, I had a job to do, at least for the time being. <clears throat> and at least the next time I got a nighttime request for a house call, I'd know what to do. But no two calls are ever the same. A few days after the dead puppies incident, Jenny, Jamie's six-year-old middle daughter, came into the clinic carrying a tiny kitten. Dr. Carlson, Cupcake is mine, all mine, my very own kitten. She said it was pure delight. As a middle daughter myself, I understood that having her own kitty made Jenny feel extra special. Cupcake was an adorable buff-colored kitten, female tabby, with an enormous purr. I took her through her first physical examination and round the vaccines and deworming and he pronounced her in excellent health. Jenny asked me many, many questions, and we had a serious discussion about the proper care of cupcakes. Cupcake teaching clients, 
how to properly care for their cats is still my favorite part of practice. I guess that's the teacher in me coming out. Jenny paid close attention, and I was sure she and Cupcake would be just fine. It seemed to me that Cupcake was a wonderful kitten for Jenny. I abandoned her telling her closest secrets to Cupcake, just as I told mine to my gray tabby Smokey when I was young. Cupcake would be there for her when she felt ignored and stuck in the middle, neither the bossy big sister nor the baby of the family. As I sent Jenny and Cupcake on their way, I remember thinking that childhood kittens and their owners are meant to have long, happy relationships filled with love, joy, and delicious secrets. One evening, not too long after Jenny and Cupcake's visit, Earl and I were sitting outside our house chatting, playing with the horses, and just enjoying being together after a hectic day. My pager beat, or pagers had been, disturbing the peaceful twilight. When I called the number, Jamie answered, her voice frantic. Her husband, Steve, had run over Cupcake with his car and would not come out of their room. Jenny was in hysterics. Could I please come to their house right away? Well, with Rookie in experience and confusion rolling around in my brain, I asked Jamie what I could possibly do for her if the kitten was already dead. I could hear the shaking in her voice as she said she would pay a house call fee if I would come and officially pronounce Cupcake dead. Just for Jenny's sake. A terrible thing had just happened and this was beyond her experience as a mother. She needed my help. I agreed to come right away. I hung up the phone feeling panic. Oh my gosh, what was I supposed to do? Perform an exam on an already dead patient? How does one do that? Was this to be a theatrical performance? My acting skills were non-existent. <laughs> They're not taught in vet school. I thought back to when I was Jenny's age. We had a small Pekingese dog named Tang. Remember Tang? Okay. Tang had been on the sidewalk with our family when the neighbor's Airedale, Pip, came racing across the street and bit through Tang's chest, killing him instantly. It happened without warning and right in front of me. I remember my mom picking me up and holding me in her arms for days afterwards while I sobbed uncontrollably. No matter how anxious I felt, I knew I had to look like the professional Jenny needed me to be. I put on a crisp white lab coat and looped my stethoscope around my neck, as I, which I never do. I think wearing stethoscopes as necklaces is stupid, <laughs> unless you have no pocket to put them in. And white coats are impractical. Veterinary medicine can trash a white coat pretty quickly with nasty smelling fluids. I walked up the driveway carrying the vet bag I knew I wouldn't need, looking like an experienced doctor of veterinary medicine. As I approached the pretty little stone and wood house, I saw curly-haired Jenny, backlit by the light spilling from the open garage. She ran to me, sobbing and gasping, her face red from crying. She stared up at me and said, Dr. Carlson, my big, big, big kitten is dead. I knelt down and I gave her a long, silent hug. Cupcake's body was lying on its side in the garage slightly flattened and clear again. Jenny held her breath as I grabbed my stethoscope and listened for a sound I knew I would not hear. I adjusted the stethoscope, moving it gently over the little kitten's chest with great care. Even now, I listen to a patient's chest for a long time. 
it looks as though I'm doing a really thorough cardiac exam, but I'm actually thinking, what in the world should I do next? <laughs> this time, I had some help knowing what to do. Rick and Mortis was saying it. What I needed to do wasn't easy, but it was clear. I turned to Jen and I said, yes, sweetheart, Cupcake is gone. Jenny let out a long sigh, then burst into tears and fled into the house. When I asked about Steve, Jamie said he was so mortified about what he'd done that he would have come out of the bedroom. It really wasn't his fault, I said. Knowing this grisly accident was perfectly understandable to a veterinarian, but unthinkable to Cupcake's family. I explained what most likely had happened. Cats will seek out warm, cozy places, places no one imagines a pet will hide in. Steve had no way of knowing that Cupcake was napping on top of a comfortable tire. When he pulled, put the car into reverse and backed up, the tire had crushed the sleeping Cupcake. Jamie and I talked about grief how people process grief in their own way, and how Jamie might help her husband work through his grief, his feelings, as well as how to help Jenny and her sisters cope. That evening was a powerful, teachable moment for me, too. I learned that I should talk to clients about possible accidents and how to prevent them when discussing how to care for a pet. I learned that house calls aren't only for being, for caring for a beloved pet, but also about being there for the humans that love the pet. Losing Cupcake would leave a void in Jenny's life. That's a tough thing to experience, especially when you're a little girl who, had, who finally had her very own kitten. I couldn't bring Cupcake back, but I could be there for Jenny and her family. On the way home, I thought about whispering secrets to Smokey all those years ago about Jane's awful death and about why I'd become a veterinarian. I knew that becoming a vet had been the right decision. It didn't matter if I stayed at this particular clinic or found work as a veterinarian elsewhere. I was where I belonged.
second quarter of that senior year of mine and that freshman year of his, he was off. He was up in Laramie working in a practice. And then he came back for my last semester, my last prime quarter of season, and his last quarter of his freshman year. And we started to go all over the hospital and he showed me the animals. And uh, it was really, it was just, I just thought it was really cool. I always wanted to be a doctor. My dad was a physician. But he wouldn't even let us read his medical books, which were 20 years old when we were old enough to read them. So I thought, this is pretty cool. I'll try for it. So I had to go back and get all the pre-vet science classes, not the ones I had to be a PE teacher. I mean, this was um, OPEM right. and biochemistry and all the heavy duty things. It took me five years to do it. So when I started vet school, I was 30, and I was a non-traditional age student, a non-trad, but the oldest guy in my class was, I think, almost 50. Mm -hmm. So you can go back to school and apply. <laughs> oh, are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So what inspired you to write, write about your experiences? I like to write in blogs came from 2008 and my husband was still alive and I had a friend of ours set up a blog for me and I wrote stories and some of those stories are in the book and I had a picture of my cat Frank and my open computer and he was just right there and it looked like he was typing. So I had a, I don't have it anymore, but I, I had a column called Ask Frank. <laughs> could ask questions, and mostly they didn't. So Frank would diss on his, his dog and the horses and the two other cats I had. Which was really funny, though. But yeah. Did you have a question? Did you ever need a, a support to get up on board? Well, it depends, and there's a story about that. Um, right now, I wrote this hip seven, 18, 19 months ago. This oh. hip's already replaced. This is the way you get a stirrup, stirrup up on it. My horse lives in Tucson, and my sister takes care of her. I didn't want to ride, I just didn't want to ride next year. And I got a lot fine with this hip, but this is the one you get up on. My sister, we all used to be the same size, but I can't believe my sister is 70 years old. And she's kind of not as tall as I am anymore. And she's going to buy us having step stools. But when I was recovering from my hip injuries, I had a, I had a step stool to get on the horse. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes? I'm curious where your hometown is in Illinois. I'm from Illinois. I'm um, from where are you from? Bradley, Bradley, Bradley Bourbon area. About an hour south of Chicago. Yeah, I stay there. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> if you live in Chicago land, there's Chicago land and downstate, even if you live west. Even if it's an hour away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard of Bourbon. Yeah, I've heard of that. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, pet food seems to be a huge industry nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what kinds of things you recommend well, I have three. I had three cats. I I got home on Sunday last week, and I looked at my oldest cat, who was eighteen, mm -hmm. and I took him and I put him to sleep the next day. Mm -hmm. He had cancer, and he was the healthiest looking one. I've got one cat who is a wreck of bones, what we call him. He's got a beautiful coat, but if you pet him, he's got hyperthyroidism, um. and He's just a skeleton, but he's got this gorgeous coat, mm -hmm. and he purrs, and he's loving. And then Frank, who is a great big cat, too. They're brothers. Frank and Cowboy Joe are brothers. And Cowboy Joe is my husband, was a Wyoming fan, and his dad was president of the University of Wyoming and was a veterinarian also. And um, so when I got Ivy, she came with this really expensive pet food called Fromm. 
And eventually, she stopped eating it. So I got her science diet, puppy food. And then she ate it. Because what dogs will do, when I got my Huskies, we had two Huskies before. We were married for 27 years. We had a dog the whole time, and we only had two dogs. And our dogs lived a long time. And they came home with Purina. And then I wanted to change them to science diet, because it's I think it's a better food. You asked me, five people outside, but we'll do five opinions. Mm -hmm. And so what they started doing was picking out the Purina and eating the science diet. And I just started doing that. But now my cats are so old, they're eating the dog food, and there are two types of dog food in her, because I'm transitioning her. There are two types of dog food in her bowls, and there are, I have three types of dog food, or cat food downstairs where Ivy has a bowl, and I won't let her go down. Not that she'll eat the food, but I don't want her eating anything else down there. So, um, but right now, the cats are getting feline WD that's got a lot of protein and it's her kidney complement as well. And um, what else do I have down there? Royal Canin for kidney failure. And then she's got um, Science Diet Adult. And she's just started liking, what's the other stuff? I can't remember it. I'll think about it while I talk about it later. So they do what they want. And the thing is, you know, my cat Pruny, who up until when Matthew died, was the longest living cat I ever had. She was 17. Um, Pruny developed renal failure, chronic renal failure at 15, which pretty much they all do. And at the time, science diet, KD, kidney diet, only came in cans. Mm -hmm. She went on a hunger strike and lost a lot of weight. She was a tiny little cat. She wasn't an 18 pound cat like mine, these, the ones I have now that it used to be. She was eight pounds. And if, you know, if you lose, if a 10 pound cat loses a pound, it's losing 10% of its body weight. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, Bernie, let's forget it. Eat what you want. And then she was fine. She lived two more years. And all I wanted from her was to live until I graduated vet school. And she died four months after vet school. So yeah. So you just have to find out what they want. They don't get snacks, though, except I've got some things for Ivy. And she's got some chew sticks. And I'll tell you this, they use every part of an animal to make sticks. And she likes bully sticks. <laughs> and they're these long rolled up things, and I'll let you imagine what part of <laughs> an animal that came from. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> I love answering questions. Yes. So Ivy is your therapy dog. What exactly does that mean? Is, is she a therapy dog to you, or is she a therapy no. dog that you take to other people? No. Okay. If I needed her, she'd be a service dog. Okay. Mary, could you repeat the question we can't hear? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Devin asked if Ivy was my therapy dog or a dog I took around. And I don't need a therapy dog. I do need a hang, a hang tag in my window. But um, Ivy and I, the, the whole thing about the alliance of therapy dogs is to bring smiles and joy. You know, think of spending your time in bed or going in a walker and there's one lady who sits in the same place every day, and I go in and I say, hi Nancy, how you doing? And she doesn't say anything. And I would say, would you like to pet the dog? And she'd say no. And there's one woman there who all she can say is yes. And I say, hi, do you wanna see Ivy? Yes. Do you wanna pet Ivy? Yes. Mm -hmm. And some of the people have, um, they've had strokes. And they had, you know, one side is this way. And Ivy knows to go over to the other side, because I'll say wheelchair, 
and they can pet her. And I'll say, do you want to give Ivy a stroke? And sometimes their hands are like this anyway. And then I'll hold my hand up like that, and I will take it. And um, she does tricks for them. She tries to get the food they spill from their own <laughs> thing that they eat. Mm -hmm. But a service dog is allowed access anywhere. You can take one on a plane. You can take one in any store, any restaurant. And you know, when I was in Albuquerque, I had lunch with a colleague. And we went out on the patio, and I got on the bench seat. And she was sitting there, and I took pictures of me with the, with the menu pointing like that. And it, and it came out really cute. But she's a good dog. She's a good dog, and she's very, very smart. You tell her something once, and she does it. So the therapy dogs and service dogs are not the Service same. dogs are the top of the line. They're for people who need assistance. And there are service dogs <coughs> for seizures. They can tell a person if this person was a, a seizure patient, the dog would lie down or, or lick the person, or the, the person would know to lie down and have a seizure and they get up again. And um, there are well, one person I know who trained Ivy and passed her on her three tests that she had to have, she, her dog was a Papillon, you know, the really cute little dog with the big ears. And um, she was not only a therapy dog, and she was so small that she had to take her in a baby carriage. Because, you know, Ivy couldn't be a hospital dog. Everybody wants to go to the hospital. But if you're in a hospital bed, you can't see the dog. And the nursing homes are just crying out for dogs. So, but this lady's dog was a therapy dog and a service dog. She was a therapy dog for the people in the care facilities, and she was her own service dog for blood sugar. They can tell when blood sugar is about to happen. So I assume she was a diabetic. I don't, I don't know what the other thing is. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that you have to go to. You have to know this. Every year she has to get her shots. And she doesn't need a fecal exam anymore. She's, she's going to be three years old. She doesn't have worms. But they have to have it, so I do it. And then there's this magazine that you get. And it's really fun to read. And then you have to show the place where you're going in that she's up to date on everything. And there's a one facility in town in Fort Collins where I was visiting my friend's mother. And she says, oh, you can bring her in. And uh, why don't you bring her in any time? Well, I can't. Because if she's a certified therapy dog, they take care of insurance if something happens. Mm -hmm. But I could take her to visit my friend's mother. So, are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, um, I hear a lot about therapy dogs, but are there other therapy animals that people have? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is a really neat YouTube of a huge horse <laughs> with braided manes, and he knows which rooms to go in. A lot of the nursing homes have cats that just live there. And there are some cats who will go and sit on top of a patient, and that cat knows that that patient's gonna die that night. And the, I think the first time Ivy and I went to um, our nursing home, there was a whole family in a semicircle, and there were trays of snacks and things to eat and drink, and there was a lady in the bed, and I said hello to them. I said, would you like to pet my dog? And they said, yes, and I should have, what I should have known, but I, I was a rookie, was to say, would you like me to take Ivy up to see your mother? And I could have taken her mother's hand and she could feel something soft. Because I think there's a lot to people in comas and near death 
that no more than they think they know. Yeah. So there are characters, horses, horses, mini horses, yeah. goats, <laughs> mini pigs. Um, golly, a friend of mine rescued, there was a story on the news about the lion's shelter that was gonna put this cute little chihuahua mix to sleep. And he called the next day, he says, we're coming down, don't put that dog to sleep. And they took it home. And he trained her as a therapy dog. Huh. And he goes to the hospital once a week. Mm. Named her Gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, is there anything else? Yes. Do you think there, uh, if you think your dog might have some characteristics that would be good for a therapy dog, what might what might you see in that dog? Great question. It's not mandatory that you take your dog to training classes. I did because I don't like bad dogs. And this is the only dog I've ever let sleep on the bed. And I move her, whereas my husband would get close to me. I'd say, there, we had two twins put together, twin sheets, and there was a line that said, Go back over the line, but I'll cut the tongue. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, so what I I took her to the classes, and but you can train your own dog, and as long as she passes the tests, she gets to become registered. And see, I have my little. I mean, I have my member ID number. Ivy has hers, but you couldn't take Ivy and go visit your grandma with a therapy dog. I have to be with Ivy, yeah. So what are the what behaviors do you see that make a dog a good candidate? This dog doesn't have a mean bone in her body. I did not pick Ivy. Ivy was chosen for me, and there was such a long, long line. I was amazed to even get one from this litter. And there was one more litter with the studs straw of semen in it, and I never got to see her because um, the owner got sick and went to live in New York with her daughter. But one of the dogs in the litter was a brown dog, and this was the people I saw in Arizona and New Mexico. And the daughter is 24 years old and is a very low autistic girl. And I have an autistic friend that I named my cat Matthew after. And he's out working full time. And he's had four open heart surgeries. You know, and he's, you know, he's, he's the only one of the few kids who would actually sit down and talk to a teacher about, with, about something other than school. And I said a couple of years ago, I said, you know, you and your folks need to come over because Matthew's getting up there and you've never seen him. And for graduation, I gave him a framed picture of Matthew, who was an orange tabby. He wasn't long-haired, so he's kind of a mutant. But um, he keeps the picture on his bed. And I had to call him two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, Matthew, I just want to tell you that I've got some bad news for you. Because I had called his mom first. And I said, well, what time? I'd like to tell him. So what time will Matthew be? Yeah, you do. So, yeah. How do you handle the emotional side of being a veterinarian? Seeing abused animals and then euthanization. Is that, how do you balance that to make that? Um, abused animals, we are required by law to call the authorities. And I had a guy, a weird guy, with a young boy come in with a cat, with a kitten that was nice, but as the kitten grew up, it became vicious. And I don't know what was going on, but I said, you know, I think you need to get another dog. I've told clients, you know, one guy pulled up with two cats in his trunk. And I lived, at our, the clinic was in our house, and I opened the door and the cats flew out. And I, my thing is I refuse to chase cats, except when I was training in Virginia, there was an 88-year-old lady, and the cat was under the bed, so I couldn't do it. And 
when I was 35, she just said, you really want to come back here. So, but um, did I answer your question? Oh, euthanasia. Euthanasia is very, very special. It's a gift we can do. I took Matthew in a week ago last Monday, and um, we took an x-ray just to be sure. And it turned out his eyes, eyes were also totally dilated, so he was blind. And I hadn't noticed, I'd noticed that his eyes were dilated. I hadn't noticed he was blind because he could get all over the house. You know, you can have a blind animal perfectly well, just don't move the furniture on them. <laughs> you know, you don't change the furniture. But euthanasia is a gift that we can give them. And there are practices now where all they do is come to your house and do euthanasia, or there's one practice that has a, like a small house and they can bring the cat. And I didn't like, you know, taking Matt for that last ride, but I didn't want to pay $500. And they were nice enough to let me do everything except the text. I had the text for the cat to wear. And then the vet and I, my colleague, um, she handed me the things that I put in the sleeve. And she left me before she, we came in and did it. And yeah, I cried and I kissed him and I kissed him after he was dead and brushed him. And I got his ashes back. I mean, they're, if you looked for him, you could find him, but I'm going to take him to Arizona and he's going to go in my beautiful garden. So, yeah. But it's a gift. It's a gift. But I have never done a convenience euthanasia. And here's the trouble in veterinary medicine. If you have a cat that's clawing your things, mm. people will take their cats to the shelter and get, get rid of them. You don't just get rid of somebody you love. And now vets with all PETA and all these, you've seen the billboards where the fingers are off the end of the person. They all do declaws. I will. I'm not in practice anymore. But declawing a cat can save its life. I had my fur, the first cat I ever declawed, Fletcher. He was dumb as a box of rocks, but he was my second favorite cat, along with Frank, when he was the first. And I had him declawed by a friend of mine when we went away for Thanksgiving. She did a terrible job, and his last two bones were just frozen like that. He was a great cat, but he's a fantastic cat. We'd roll them up and put them in a little, like a little kitty burrito, and uh, he'd just stay there. And one thing we did with him, there was an empty large Kleenex box. And you remember those ponytail holders that had the plastic things on there, and you just put one over the other? I went like this for Fletcher, and I dropped it in, and he, he's like, and he went to get it, and he came up, and the Kleenex box was on top of his head. <laughs> so he's walking over here, and he bumps into the wall, and he's like this. And he walks over here, and he's bumping in the wall. If he had been a blind cat, he would have known where he was. <laughs> so I took it out, and I said, here, Fletcher, do it. And I did it again. He did it again. <laughs> and Earl and I were sitting on a bed, and we were just laughing. Socks up, it was so funny, and that's the last time he did it. Mm -hmm. I think he went this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, would you like to see Miss Ivy? Yeah, I want. Okay, and then we, I can stay for a while afterwards, and don't forget the cookies because otherwise I'm gonna have to eat them. <laughs> and um, so, my friend Diane over in Ivy, up. Oh. can you hear me if I talk without the microphone? Okay. Hi. Because I used to be a teacher for 30 years. I can talk to you. I can talk loud. I think come. Come on, Lucy, when you're tired. Do you want pepperoni? Come here. Come here. Come here. Ivy. Come here. Ivy. Come here.
And these dogs don't shed. They don't smell doggy. Which is why I like Husky, for Husky shed. You can take that nicely. Okay, do you want to spin? Hard trick to teach.
and she always knows when the UPS guy is coming in. <laughs> and she discovered her voice at five months of age, and it's just this big, booming voice. And it's so cute because we're, we're upstairs, and I've got the window open and the shade open like this. She'll be on the back of the couch, and somebody go by, she <laughs> and it's just so funny. You can't leave the there. Yeah, that's a big part. What did she think of the cats? The minute, she, the question was, what does she think of my cats? The instant I brought her into the house, she's this big. She licked Cowboy Joe all over. <laughs> all over. <laughs> She sleeps with her cats. We all sleep on the bed. Cowboy, Cowboy's always had a depth perception problem, and so I put a little um, Pure One Papa Sam stool, and he jumps from that onto the bed. But he's also not the sharpest bulb in the chandelier. No, but he's a wonderful cat. He's so good. And cats, cats make good play pianos too. So yeah. What made you decide to practice only feline medicine? Because I can pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair and enough. Then I, I would do our horses. Okay. And my husband would say, Mary, can, can you go out and look at training? And we had one horse lived to 30. That was the horse of my life, and it's Mueller. And I would acupuncture her, and my friend gave her a special diet that we gave her, and she lived a long time. Mm -hmm. And she had a I took her for a ride after I got home from a trip, and she was just kind of hacking, and this green slime came out of her mouth. And the next day, I euthanized her. I, we, no, I, I acupunctured her. And the next day, Monday, I called the large animal rooms, because she has the look. Animals get the look. Mm -hmm. Some people can yeah. find it, some, some can't tell. And I called the vet hospital and I said, I need to bring our horse in. She says, well, we don't see patients on Monday. I said, what? I said, if this is an emergency and it's probably going to be euthanasia, would you like to change your mind, ma'am? And she said, yeah. <laughs> so I called the head of the hospital and so, anyway. So I know in vet school you have to study all the animals. Uh -huh. um, which is very difficult. Uh, what is probably the most difficult species to veterinize? Pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it. I've had a story about pigs and the book, and I'm not going to give it away. But um, remember James Harriet's story yeah. about the first in his class, a really snooty guy, and he did did some work for them on his off time. And he was sent to bleed pigs, get some blood from a pig for analysis. And the guy just got covered all yeah. over with. You, you don't smell good when you get around pigs. <laughs> you really don't. Because one time we went to a, we went to an SPF pig farm where you shower in and shower out. Because there's no disease. And okay, I'm not the biggest person in the room here. And so you go, you shower, and that's why I wanted large animal in the summer, because I, I just wanted to have, you know, be outside in the <laughs> summer. And so I, I put the farmer stuff on, and I'm holding my, this jeans up like a, a barrel. <laughs> and my, my professor came over and grabbed me and went like this, and he put some adhesive tape around the the loops for the belt <laughs> and wrap me up and it's good to go. <laughs> and then we had to shower out and put our own clothes on. <laughs> but then we went to another place that was inside and farms are moving to not doing that anymore. And I got home and we had showers in our locker rooms. I went home and I just wafting up and I just I left everything at the door and creeped upstairs and it just I that was horrible. <laughs>
And they're nasty. They bite. Yeah. Pigs are vicious. Mm -hmm. But they're awfully cute. And they do make good therapy animals. Mm -hmm. The mini pigs. They're smart. They're, smart. they're very yeah. smart. Mm -hmm. Very smart. Where is my dog? Oh, there she <laughs> is. Okay. <laughs> Snoozing with the people. Fish moves. Well, I hope everybody gets a chance to love on Heidi. Yes. 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 And I might even give you a pepperoni. Trudy, <laughs> <laughs> should we sign books now? Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah.